Hello, this is Troy Kilpatrick and I'm the Executive Director for the Journey Museum and Learning Center and I'll be your guide and host today on this Black Hills journey. The Journey Museum and Learning Center located in Rapid City, South Dakota is a huge timeline and one of our goals is to always reveal the connections from billions of years ago to current day between our history, our heritage and the scientific connections that exist. Today on our Black Hills journey, we're going to go on a monumental journey and look for the connections of arts and culture and how it has affected our communities and our state and everything that we do here. Today I'm standing in front of a mural that is reflective of the Journey Museum and Learning Center itself. Again, a reflection of arts and culture at the same time that we're a fabulous scientific facility too. So we're gonna go and we're gonna visit some of the world's most iconic and known landscapes and art pieces to be found. Mount Rushmore, Crazy Horse, Dignity, and some of the stories in between in the communities throughout our state and in Rapid City as we choose to try to find the connections of arts and culture and the vibrancy of everyday life in our communities and as a place where we welcome our guests to the Black Hills. Thank you for joining me today on a monumental journey and Black Hills Journeys. The whole idea came from Joan Robinson. And Doan was a state historian for the state of South Dakota, and he loved his state. He wanted everyone else to come in and love it. He's like, get them into the Black Hills. And so the plan was to create something that was so big, so awesome, that people would have to come to South Dakota and see it. And his chosen venue was giant artwork on the mountain. There are giant spires of granite rock in Custer State Park. They're standing like pinnacles. He thought, we'll carve those into statues. We'll carve them in the round. And we'll do people like Fremont and Chief Red Cloud and Lewis and Clark. And people will come and they'll see that and they'll enjoy the state of South Dakota. So that's a pretty cool idea to bring people into his favorite place. So after uh, convincing some other folks that this might be a great idea, and I do emphasize might be a great idea because it was pretty crazy back at that time too. Many people did not think it was feasible, but in that day and age they went ahead anyway because there was enough interest and dream and drive and seeing how far they could take this vision. The sculptor, Gutzon Borglum, was contacted. He had uh, done a mountain carving, or was in the middle of doing a mountain carving down in Stone Mountain, Georgia. And so it's kind of a small select crew of artists to choose from that have any um, experience in, in carving a mountain. And Borglum, he's a guy that's already thinking big. He came out to the Black Hills, he brought his son Lincoln out. Lincoln was 12 years old, just a, just a young man. And he looked at those spires and he said, he didn't like the rock formation, he didn't think it had the southern exposure that he wanted for the sculpture to be lit in a way naturally that, uh, that he thought would enhance it. And uh, Borglum also did not like the idea of the uh, American heroes. Borglum told Robinson, hey, you're not thinking big enough. You need to go presidential. And when Borglum saw the big rock here, he said, that's it, a big pellet of granite for me to use. And so that collaboration led to choosing the site known as Mount Rushmore and of the um, actual subject matter becoming the president's um, and not necessarily the president's that you see right now. Roosevelt was pretty controversial. The other three, everybody said, okay, but not Roosevelt. But Borgham said, nope, he's going up there because that is the president that stood for the common man. And you know, if you think about it, you don't take on a big audacious dream like sculpting a granite mountain in the Black Hills without having a, a healthy uh, dose of confidence. Mount Rushmore is an incredible work of art, a giant work of art, a work of art that is 90% done with dynamite. Now, I don't always think of dynamite as an artist's brush, but that's certainly what Borglum thought. 
So when people come here to Mount Rushmore, some of them are coming because they are artists, they are sculptors, they are engineers, and they want to come and see this incredible feat that this man managed to pull off. There was never any doubt about his artistic ability or, or that he was indeed the keeper of the vision. And so, um, and sometimes those creative minds are a little difficult as managers, but I think the result speaks for itself. So in 1939, Chief Henry Standing Bear wrote and asked Dad if he would be interested in carving a memorial to the Native American people. And Dad thought about it for many years. He went through World War II, and in 1948, he decided that he would come out here and dedicate his life to carving this mountain. And then Mother joined him, and this is where we're at today. Dad lived in a tent for six months, and he had volunteers that came on later, which one of them was mother. And then there were many years where people maybe didn't understand what Dad and Henry Standing Bear were trying to tell the story of and trying to do. And so for about 25 years, we just kept at it, one story at a time, one block at a time. And the purpose of Crazy Horse, how important it is to tell the story of the North American Indians. We've had the Indian University of North America going on for 11 years, and over 300 young students have gone through their curriculum. And they carry on out in their lives today, either graduated from college or are still in college. And that's the purpose of carving the mountain, is the university. And then the museums, that's another purpose, to tell the story of a race of people that are very important here. Imagine what it's like taking parking away from a downtown area. That was not an easy thing to do. Downtown was doing well, but not great. Just no real lift. So we were, we were together as a small group going like, okay, what can we do next? So we took this 48 space parking lot, took it to the city, took it to the council and said, here's our idea. We want to build a downtown gathering space. Once we got it signed off, again, not everybody was in favor of it. So it was opposed by a small group that actually brought it to vote. Over 60% voted yes, let's build it. After we got the swerving portions of the granite done, then we wanted carving. We didn't want jackhammers. We didn't want big changes. We wanted subtle artistic changes. And that's where Yuki Nagasaki was selected. Now, being this done by hand and no machine, he would come back for seven or eight months of good working weather and work and do one one year, one the next year, one the next year, one the next year, and finally finished it at the end of year five. People can walk by and go, well, that's nice, but every one of them means something. They all have a theme, but having the art of wind and water, something different, whether it's the wind that blows through South Dakota, the grasses that flow through South Dakota, the water that flows in our state. All of the artwork here has a message. Every bit of it has a message. In 1999, we decided we were going to have a press conference and announce this grand project to the city of Rapid City. Rapid City was a little bit confused by the idea. They, they weren't, I can't say that they were particularly receptive, but we, we did manage to get donors for the first statues. And we decided that the mechanics of it would be, we don't care if it's not politically relevant, make it interesting. And then we decided that we would go to the beginning and the end of the presidency. And then we would have two new guys that everybody knew and would be willing to fund, and maybe a couple of the old guys that were going to be a little harder to fund. 
And we had donors that were lined up around the block wanting to do President Lincoln. That, okay, you can do Lincoln, but you'll also have to do Millard Fillmore. After the artist has a concept, then the artists all get together, the four of them, and they critique one another's statues. And it, it was kind of a rocky road a little bit initially, but you know, they blossomed with that because the statues were as good as four artists could make them. We are a state of, of enormous sculptures, I must admit. <laughs> About six, seven years ago, uh, a gentleman, a businessman from Rapid City, Norm McKee, um, approached me and he wanted to give back something to South Dakota. Uh, he had an idea of a large scale sculptural piece. He wanted it to be native and he wanted it to be a woman. I was initially reluctant as I often am in projects, but once I began to explore the idea, uh, I became increasingly enthused and away we went. Uh, anytime you have the kind of sweeping vistas that we have here in South Dakota, it's important to create something sufficient to stand up in that space. The work on this scale is as much an engineering feat as it is an artistic feat. We dedicated the work in uh, 2016 and I have to say that it, in terms of, of the, the time in which we created it and the current climate of, of our society today, that it just couldn't have happened at a better time. I mean, it's a real celebration of the native nations that we have here in South Dakota and in this region. And I think it uh, does inspire us to see the beauty and the durability of their cultures and to encourage the next generations. You know, it's something that, that I'm so grateful that I had a chance to be part of it. In the middle to late 30s, the leadership of Rapid City at the time had ideas of doing dinosaurs on, on this hill here. Emma Sullivan, who, who was here as a lawyer in Rapid City, who came to Rapid City in 1927, he kind of puttered around with uh, doing little sculptures of uh, Western memorabilia. Realistically, he was probably more uh, known for the real rattlesnake ashtrays than anything. And he was asked by the government, the WPA, to, to do this. And he started in 1936. He was given $25,000, 15 months to complete the project, which that's a big project, I think, in 15 months. We got it done, and there were 14 WPA uh, workers who helped Emmett Sullivan with this. And uh, as I said before, there were all their names are enclosed in this uh, a time capsule, and they stuck it in the leg of the Patasaurus, saying that this will last until whenever the dinosaurs basically decay and fall apart, which hopefully it will never happen because Rapid City is pretty proud of what's up here. Originally, uh, Tyrannosaurus Rex had a good number of sharp teeth in his mouth and after 83 years, they're all gone. As many older people lose their teeth over the years, he has too, and, but he still is the major uh, dinosaur up on the hill and looks over Rapid City and has been for 83 years. Art is what made tourism a thing in the Black Hills of South Dakota. You look at all of the beauty that started here, obviously, before we really were promoting the area to visitors, but it, it's when it became popular is when we brought in the great monuments. That is when things started kicking in and people thought, hmm, I think we can make this an area for not only art and history, but to explore the great outdoors. Although we still love our Black Hills monuments and attractions, there's got to be a reason for people to want to come specifically to Rapid City. So what happens? We get the Journey Museum. We get the City of Presidents. We get some beautiful art galleries. There are reasons for people to spend time right in Rapid City, South Dakota, and all of those are art.
All of those are culture. I think it's a real gift to live in a state like South Dakota uh, when you are, are in a statewide arts office uh, like I am. In a typical year would have over 14 million visitors coming to see the state of South Dakota and many cite as their number one inspiration to come to this state Mount Rushmore or Crazy Horse but it really to me what I love about it is that just kind of opens the door to all of the arts and culture that South Dakota really does have to offer um, once visitors get here and through the doors. The arts connect with everyone. I mean, there's not a person in South Dakota or who has stepped foot in South Dakota who hasn't had some sort of impact or an experience with, with our arts. Art South Dakota truly does serve the entire creative community of South Dakota. Our net for artists is very wide. I mean, anybody that has an interest in the arts, that has a creative inspiration, we, you know, we, we um, want to connect with them all. So originally State of Great was conceived as a way of pairing uh, an influencer with an artistic bent with an actual artist uh, or arts organization in South Dakota. And so then the idea was through these partnerships, there would be a great opportunity uh, for the co-mingling of ideas and then just another way to help shine a light on some of the artistic offerings through the state. But I think more than that, State of Create is really a point of connection. So it's a point of connection between the South Dakota Arts Council and the Department of Tourism. It's a point of connection between the arts and cultural tourism in the state of South Dakota. Most importantly to me, uh, it's a point of connection among any creative person uh, in the state of South Dakota. Anybody can create a work of art and or visit a work of art. And sometimes a work of art can be the panoramic uh, badlands over your shoulder. Uh, at sunset, but you can use the hashtag state of create and then these people are connecting through that hashtag and that's aggregated them as well through the Department of Tourism's travel uh, SD.com website. We always worry a little bit about um, narrowing the focus too much or shining the spotlight too often on the, just the economic value because the arts are so much more important than just a dollar, right? And just the, than just the measurement of money. But when we look at the, the value or the impact of the arts on the economy, the high point figure is that in the Black Hills region, so when you look at the Black Hills, Rapid City and the surrounding areas, when you look at that as a region, the arts nonprofit sector, just the nonprofit sector, and that's a $115 million a year industry. Every year, it's generating $115 million of economic activity. In a typical year, we're supporting probably at least 100 if not more artists directly with some type of grant support and then our real hope at the arts council is the work of those artists cascades then across the state and really offers all kinds of, of fantastic in-person arts opportunities uh, or in the case of current times virtual arts <laughs> opportunities for all the residents or as many residents of the state of south dakota as we can serve So it's not just about uh, showing and sharing, it's also about driving a connection with people and uh, driving the connection to the arts, which are so important. It's uh, a common language that we can all speak through art and, and music, and, uh, and it's a blessing to be able to share that. Uh, that's what we get to do, which is pretty exciting day in, day out. The community that we serve is not only the greater community of the visitation, but also working with Native arts and artists to serve as kind of the, the bridge and conduit for them to connect with the world so that our visitors understand that Native arts and culture is alive and well today and how that continues on today, either in, from traditional means to modern and contemporary voices. Every year we work with anywhere from um, 80 to 100 plus artists uh, through various programs. 
We have artists in residence every month where a master artist from across the continent, across the country, uh, will come here to work in a studio space and interact with the community. And then we have uh, artists like Living Treasures. It's a one week program at the beginning of every month where master artists do hands-on immersion with the arts, which is really cool. Uh, it's one of my favorite programs where they get to actually share their culture and their art with people. They get to take part in that and take something home that they've created. It's humbling to be in such a, a state or an organization that works with something on such a grand level. Uh, I mean, because we have the largest carving, mountain carving in the world, but then we also have the works and artwork of both uh, artist laureates of the state of South Dakota. We have a piece by Oscar Howe in the collections and we have work by Dale Lamphere as well in the collections here. So you understand that it's something grander than you, bigger than you. Um, the spirit of just that uh, is inspiring enough. But then you also realize when you meet these artists and make those positive connections with them, you see the, the humble nature of the artists themselves, the connection to the um, uh, who they are as people uh, is such a positive experience. Well, I think we're really fortunate um, here in Western South Dakota to have one of the finest collections of Lakota art anywhere in the country at the Sioux Indian Museum uh, here inside the Journey Museum and Learning Center. The collection is really special because it um, contains both historical pieces from the 19th and early 20th century, as well as some of the finest examples of contemporary Native American art from the second half of the 20th century. When the museum was founded in the 1930s, the concept of the museum was to capture the, the vanishing culture of the Native American peoples. And it was conceived of as really a history museum. When the Indian Arts and Crafts Board took over operations of the museum in 1958, there came with that a major shift in the mission and operations of the museum. And the mission of the Indian Arts and Crafts Board is to promote economic development for contemporary Native American and Alaska Native artists. In the 1960s, there were very limited opportunities um, for Native artists to show in major museums. So the Indian Arts and Crafts Board was kind of leading the, the way um, in that sense. Art has always been an integral part of Lakota culture. You know, uh, every aspect of daily life in the pre-reservation era really incorporated elements of art, uh, whether that be clothing or ceremonies. You know, there was constantly that, that thread of arts running through it. But the, the creation of Native American arts and crafts today and the sale of those is a, a major driving factor in, in the health um, and economy of, of Native American communities. And that also benefits uh, everyone in surrounding areas. So I think Rapid City is sort of this unique melting pot of Native and non-Native cultures. The perfect location, I guess, um, to really appreciate how important arts and culture is. I mean, when we think about why do people come to South Dakota, I think, you know, the most obvious is they come for our landscapes, they come for Mount Rushmore, they come for the Badlands, but then they come for the, the culture and the, the art. And so I think, you know, we have a wonderful opportunity to share those examples of arts and culture um, here at the Journey Museum and in Rapid City as a whole. It's, it's so inspiring to see and to meet all of the creative South Dakotans. I mean, in every corner, every community, there is a vibrant and um, inspired arts scene. Artists, arts group, arts council. We truly, and I mean this on a, on a very higher level, we are the state of create. I mean, I think, you know, when you look at per capita, we probably have some of the most artists of anywhere in the country. That has been an honor in this job is to be able to travel and meet so many people. And it's, it's inspiring us to do our work. But if you can learn history through the biography of someone, it's a much better way to learn history. And so with every one of the presidents, there's just a little bit of history. You know, there's enough history to push you over the edge to realize that this, this is a continuum. And for me, when I look at the sculpture, 
Um, the, the pieces that were um, touched by man are very finely done and, and the artwork itself is of great value. What really translates into today are the unfinished parts of the sculpture where it kind of fades into um, the unfinished. And I think to me that's the American story. It's, it's still being written. I had a gentleman, an older gentleman, who he was walking through here, spending time, he even brought his own chair. And he told me, he said, you know what, Dan? I enjoy this more than anything. I can spend hours looking at the carvings, looking at the way it's done, looking at the progress. So the, the inspiration of people just spending time, the students that come from college, the local universities, and do their own drawings of the drawings and take it back to their classrooms. Again, a whole nother set of inspiration. One of the main reasons that we care for and preserve these historic collections here at the Journey Museum is for them to be a resource for contemporary artists today. There's not much to, that's more satisfying to me than seeing a contemporary artist come in and um, get the opportunity to uh, interact and look at closely with these objects made by, in some cases, their, their distant family members, and then to create new art using that as inspiration. But I will tell you, to see the growth in this city and to see the positive people that are working so hard to make this city shine, um, I get to be a part of their daily routines. And that is one of my greatest joys. You can't imagine what could be here in 20 years. I, I probably can't imagine it. But I just like to see the art, arts, uh, society, and system grow here in Rapid City. And I know the people are ready for it and we want it. I want to encourage younger artists to jump in. The water is fine. And there are more opportunities in the arts today than there have ever been. When I started out back in the late 60s, I really didn't know any other sculptors other than Borglum and Joukowsky, but uh, no one was out trying to kind of do it full time, make a living at it, that sort of thing that was a contemporary. And now there are so many opportunities for artists and so many uh, organizations that support the arts and encourage the arts. And, I mean, it's been a wonderful change over the last 50 years. Well, Rushmore does inspire the thoughts of democracy and freedom. It still inspires artists. We have artists come to the park, set up their easel, bring their oils, bring their watercolors, and create their own art here, inspired by Borglum's work. And I think Borglum would be thrilled to know that he not only got his philosophy across, but he brought his love of art. And that is what continues into the future for many of our visitors. That love of art, creation, and sharing. Music and art bring people together. And that's a large piece of art. <laughs> and it does tell a story. And Dad always said he was a storyteller in stone. And the Native American people, they're storytellers. They passed on from one generation to the other, to the next, to the next. And so that's what that mountain is doing. But it brings people together because it's got nothing to do with uh, bias or anything else. It has to do with a story and something people should know about. So thank you again for joining us on this Black Hills journey, this monumental journey, as we've looked at all of the landscapes here in Rapid City and in our state of South Dakota. And I hope that we've been able to reveal this connection of arts and culture, how important it is to the vibrancy of a community, for a community's members, for the folks that come to visit these communities, how vitally important arts and culture is to all of us as we move forward. Today in 2020, we, re we face significantly special times, but always there's been skeptics of the arts and culture community wondering what is the value of arts and culture? What does this provide for us as a community? What does this give us for our economies? 
Today, I hope we've proven that an investment in arts and culture is an investment in economic well-being. It's an investment in a great community space and place for everyone, whether it be a visitor or a community member who shares the space. Because we believe that our journey forward as we move is always going to be tied to these links of arts and culture and how we embrace this as community members throughout all of our country in our own hometowns and in our states. So thank you for joining us today on this Black Hills journey, this monumental journey, because we know somehow, some way, the journey will continue.